the people that are listening to this podcast are those people that we talked about that have ventured outside the box. They're the few. Like, how many people think like that? How many people know about AliExpress? It's predicted that, that the sales are going to go up like three more billion dollars in the next year, year and a half, online sales. Making a Shopify store, doing eBay, doing Amazon, doing anything online selling is going to be great. You're listening to Ecomonics, a Debutify podcast, your resource for one-of-a-kind insights into the world of e-commerce and business in the modern age. This is Joseph. I'll be presenting a wealth of industry knowledge from interviews with successful business people and our own state-of-the-art research. Your time is valuable, so let's go. Amy Hunt and I had an insightful talk about the potential for eBay in the dropshipping sphere, what education needs for the future, and the importance for out-of-box thinking. We've talked to a lot of great educators over the course of this saga, and among the many lessons I learned in this episode, my greatest takeaway yet has been learning about what makes each teacher distinct, an insight oftentimes as valuable as the lessons themselves. Amy Hunt, it is great to have you here on Ecomonics. Uh, thank you for, for being here. Thank you for sharing some of your time with us. How are you doing today? How are you feeling? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, uh, you know, overall in aggregate, uh, in the interest of letting our, our listeners know kind of like a little behind the scenes, uh, we were warned that the power was going to go out and then like, oh, sorry, Amy, uh, we're going to have to reschedule this a little bit later today. And then our, our automated system kept telling you a different time. And so I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. So no, no problem. I, I have a bed to sleep in. I got food in, in the fridge. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take it's it. Good. It's all good, right? We're here now. We're going forward. We're moving forward. Mm-hmm. I uh, I have a very important question to to start us off with. It's the it's not only the same question on every episode of this, but typically sure. pretty much every interview podcast does this. Uh, okay. I see I don't see any reason why we need to use this as our as our time to stand out. Uh, well, that comes later. So, Amy, tell us uh, who are you and what do you do? So, I am Amy Hunt, and I'm known as Home Business Expert on my YouTube channel and across the websites that I have. And so. Who I am is I am a stay-at-home mom slash home business expert, which means I run my own businesses online. I'm home because Mm I uh, choose to be home, basically. I have a background in education, a master's actually, a background in coaching, different sports. So this is uh, something I love to do. I never projected myself to be doing something like this. 20 years ago when I was going through college, probably this didn't even really exist. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just morphed into where I am today. Uh, what, uh, what school did you, what college did you go to? I went to Messiah College for my undergraduate and Marietta College yeah, for my graduate master's. I was, I was wondering if it was a school that I had heard of. And in this particular case, I hadn't, it was, it was, it was worth a shot. Both are, both are small private colleges. Messiah is a Christian College in Pennsylvania. Marietta is a private college in Ohio. Mm-hmm. I I was uh, I was born and raised Catholic. I went through the the Catholic uh, Church, and um, I I don't know. I, here's here's a curiosity for you. If um, sure. the name Rob Ford rings a bell, no, it doesn't. Okay, I mean he 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 gained some notoriety. He even ended up on uh, Jimmy Kimball. He was um, our mayor of Toronto. Uh, he had he had passed, uh, but he was like Donald Trump, but on a citywide level, just, just like a, a, a one of a kind uh, a kind of guy, but he did, uh, he did pass away. And I went to the high school that he was uh, the coach for. And although it, uh, it said it was a high school, a, a Catholic high school, the most Catholic thing about it was the people would wear the rosaries like a necklace. And that was, Oh no, <laughs> uh, that was, that was, well, we had a, we had a chapel. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. Had, we had a chapel. And then one time for, for April, they uh, put us all into the auditorium. And so we had to watch passion of the Christ. Oh wow. Uh, well, they, 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 they skipped to, you know, about our, I hesitate to say action sequence, but they skipped to the part. Are that you everybody, serious? Uh, yeah. That's crazy. It was like, we want you guys to know what Jesus went through. And then, well, Wow. We, we saw. I guess it was impactful. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, I mean, that was the kind of thing people were impacted by it before they even saw it. It was like, this right. exists? Is somebody committed it to film? Yeah, yeah. R- rare chance to let that out of my system. Uh, so I'd like to start with your tagline, which is uh, see you on the other side. In uh, what is uh, the other side? Where are people not? I mean, how, are they, how are they getting to the other side exactly? I guess all my life since I was little, I've been taught to think independently. Um, in other words not even necessarily on purpose, but just to think and create and be imaginative and 
uh, be confident in what your thoughts are and stand for what you think and believe. And then that was reaffirmed when I did go to Messiah. And they really, one of the things I take away, which I'm not sure all schools do, is teach you how to teach yourself and teach you how to think so you can teach yourself. And that was huge. Like I know a lot of places just feed you, feed you, feed you. But I felt like I had stuff put on the table in front of me and they said, figure it out. And from that point on, I have been teaching myself, trying to figure it out. So, you know, the saying, you know, think outside the box. Well, most people are in the box. I was actually doing a one-on-one session yesterday with somebody and I was like, everybody wants to do A, B, and C now, because everybody's watching A, B, and C on YouTube. So like everybody sees, everybody's selling on Amazon. Everybody sees like the crazy growth and all these YouTube videos of everybody like nailing it and selling $10,000 a day and, and eBay and, um, whatever the popular stuff is that's inside the box, even though that used to be outside the box. So in 2001, when I started, or 2003, when I started selling on Amazon at the time, that was thinking outside the box because it was like mostly, I don't know if you realize or remember Amazon used to be mostly books and that's what Amazon was known for. Amazon Kindles, you get a Kindle so you could, you know, read your book. And so even then I was thinking outside the box. I was, I lived near an outlet store complex. I would go over there. I would buy stuff from the stores really, really cheap. I would go home and I would list them on eBay. I would sell them on Amazon thinking outside the box. So even today, when I had my one-on-one session last night, I said, you've got to think outside the box. Uh, the person I was doing the, the one-on-one session with was like, well, where do I sell? How do I sell? How do I get started on like eBay? How do I start on Amazon? I'm like, first of all, I want to challenge your thinking and say, think outside the box. And maybe you need to start thinking in the future, where should you be selling and what's going to grow in the future? Because eBay and Amazon are starting to be, I wouldn't say saturated. I think there's a ton of room for growth, but you might as well branch out and get those targeted areas that haven't been hit yet. So what are those targeted areas? Well, that's thinking outside the box. You got to figure that out. So when I say, see you on the other side, I just kind of added to the think outside the box. And I usually do an intro on my channel and then you'll see my box intro. And then the other side is outside the box. So most people are inside the box thinking like everyone else. See you on the other side is how do you think outside the box? So that's where I got that tagline. Well, what I appreciate is that um, the the idea of uh, independent thinking was instilled uh, in you. Now, was this, was it your, your, your family? Was it your peers? Was it school itself that uh, had laid that idea out for you? I think primarily it came from my family. My relatives are very imaginative. I'm the niece of several inventors like microchips and products. And so from the time I was little, like that was sort of the norm. Like, oh yeah, he's inventing that and he's created that and they have a factory for his product. You know what I mean? So it was just like, okay, what can I think of for the future? What can I do? Uh, how can I do that? And it was always in the back of my mind. Even when I was in college getting my, my, my degree, I was running a little business on the side. Like nobody else was doing that. I was, you know, creating products and selling clothes that the school didn't have and that people wanted. Uh, so basically you have to find where the, the need is or look for where the need is and fulfill that need into people, in people's lives. Yeah. What I, what I think happens is and and I'm relating this to to my experience because I, you know, like ten ten years ago when I was laid off from my sales job, I said that does it. I'm I'm going to make up my own job out of thin air, which was uh, podcasting. And although my 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 routine listeners at this point would be like Joseph, we we know we know, you know, this is the first time I got to talk to you, so you guys are just going to have to live with it. Which is that it has manifested into uh, what it is today, and I'm really proud of that. But being young and it, it really helps to have at least one uh, circle of influence to offer that uh, alternative idea set uh, because a lot of people, their parents will tell them to listen to what the teachers say in school. And then 
we we have our we have our little sparks in our own mind that are pushing us and driving us. But if no one um, helps to uh, encourage that or to show that it can turn into something down the line, then a lot of the times it gets lost. And I know a lot of people who like they had artistic inclinations, they were creative thinkers, but they were never shown a path for it. And what I think the teaching here is, well, no, because there's not a path. That's not the point. The point is you have to carve your own path for the first time. And so what you're saying is that things that used to be outside the box actually end up becoming now within the box because the box gets bigger. So there's this constant drive to continue to build a larger path create a bigger box, which I think what it, in the interest of finding a benefit to it, it creates more um, opportunity for other people. So it creates more of a foundation, it creates more of an industry. And then the people who continue to innovate, continue to get outside of it again. So I don't know if it's the, maybe another, I was just thinking like the blob, <laughs> the, the, the horror bill that just gets bigger and bigger and consumes things. Or maybe it's that little box inside the Amazon box. You know how the Amazon boxers are huge. <laughs> And we're still stuck in the inside box. And, and most people that are like me, they're getting outside into the bigger Amazon box. Yeah, I mean, I haven't ruled out the idea that uh, at this point, actually, Amazon has created an entire like protective dome uh, around the world. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So I, I have a few thoughts on that. Um, and it's interesting you say that because a lot of my friends, I actually just had a friend last week say, you are like five years ahead of everyone else. And I said, well, that's what I try to be mm -hmm. in, you know, the idea I was, we were, and then I was talking again yesterday about Bitcoins five, six years ago, I was telling people hesitantly because it was something nobody knew. And it was like, I, I, you know, they look like I have two, look at me like I have two heads when mm -hmm. I spoke, what is a Bitcoin? And I would say, well, it's this mathematical formula that creates money. And, and they're like, what? <laughs> You're crazy. Right. And I said, well, you really should buy some. And it was $250 at the time. And now it's like 32,000 today. They should have listened. Like most people, uh, and, and I go back and I get frustrated with school systems at this point. Like we're in the Roosevelt era, era where we're industrializing everybody and we're still stuck in that era. And we need to be morphing in the education system. And especially with my teaching background, I get frustrated with this because there is so much information out there that the school systems and what you're learning or what you have learned or everyone that's watching or listening to this or watching it, whatever the case may be, we've all been taught A, B, C, one plus one equals two. Mm -hmm. um, and to get outside of that, you're right. You need a support system. You need um, reaffirmation. You need something. So what I did when I started to really get serious about um, branching out and creating my own businesses and be an entrepreneur and that sort of thing is I started reading books. And I'm going to tell you, it was like I read and I listened to Jim Rohn, Kiyosaki, Trump. I read their books. Mm -hmm. uh, the top in the business, you know, people that already made the wheel and made the wheel work. Why reinvent it? You know, and the mindset that that taught me uh, was critical. So for anybody that is listening that doesn't have the support system, people around you think you're crazy. Hey, join the club. You know, mm -hmm. you're in our club. Uh, basically, people like us, these entrepreneurs, I, you know, we work for uh, product and sales. Everybody else works for time. I don't know if that makes sense. So what I mean by that is somebody goes to work from nine to five, you work for time. We work for the product sales. So it's a totally different mindset. It's a totally different way of thinking. Most everyone has been you know, drilled into get your nine to five job, get your regular education. I've seen a lot of people that it's interesting over the years and decades that they went a different path and everybody else thought they were a little bit crazy because they weren't getting their college education mm -hmm. and they were going into the trade world. And now these are the guys out doing motivational speaking. They run their own businesses. They're the ones that are having their, you know, boats out in the ocean. Like these are the guys that are like, they get it like because they created their own path. So I would encourage anybody that's like listening and they really want to do their own thing that it's, it's, there. Like now is the time. There is so much information out online that you don't need to go to college. I hate to say that, 
But college is important. I'm not saying it's not. There's a lot that to be learned and there's a lot of paths and avenues that people need to take college to get to. We need those people. But if you're not that kind of person, you're not the college book kind of person, don't be afraid to branch out and get educated in another way. It doesn't have to be the traditional. So I do have that frustration too that you talked about. And uh, that's kind of where I was, where I am. And and I always am looking to learn more. Like um, you had mentioned earlier about you know, just being stagnant. I, I hardly ever just sit down and watch a movie. Like when people say, well, this person, so I didn't know the guy you were talking about. I don't watch the news much. I don't sit down and watch, um, TV shows, movies. Partly it's my personality, but partly I constantly want to learn. If I wasn't that way, I wouldn't be here on the podcast with you. So it's a constant teach yourself. And it goes back to the first thing we talked about. Teach yourself. Don't be afraid to independently think and don't be spoon fed everything. That, that's fantastic. And one thing I, I, I will say is that I do, I, I make time to watch TV. I make time to play games. I'm, uh, I'm a pretty passionate nerd. And so I, I, I wouldn't want anybody to think like, oh no, my whole life is a disaster. Ooh, they just put <laughs> up an episode of WandaVision. No, I mean, okay. People have different ways of doing this. And um, well, I, I, I certainly feel like I, I, I can stand to like, cut down on 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 that time but even being even having the uh, the episodes of laziness that i do you know i made it to where i made it to so we have different uh you know we have we have different pathways and we have people have different uh, things that they can do um well you with know the time but i, w- I, I don't want to i don't want to demean what you're doing um but if you're starting off and you don't know how to do what you're doing and you go watch a tv show instead of teach or learn you're not going to get where you want it wanted to be you had to learn at some point what to do or at least experiment or go out and do it. A lot of people just think it's going to happen and yeah. they just go watch their TV show. That's really what I'm saying. I'm a big gamer too, actually. Um, actually, I'd rather sit and play a game than watch a TV show. That's the truth. <laughs> the truth behind the previous statements. Um, I do game a lot, but um, yeah. I, I tweet you, we all need to relax and we all need to have that downtime for sure. I, I will say without uh, uh, having said that, I was wondering, so are you really a dynamo where it's just like, you know, morning to night is like consuming material and learning and, and then uh, being with the kids. So I try not to be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my, but I think that's my, that is my tendency, but. You're, you're playing, uh, I'm taking a guess because of your YouTube, but are you playing Fortnite right now? Um, yes. <laughs> Not right at the moment, not, <laughs> but before not, I got on this, the not, podcast, yeah. I was. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I, um. Yeah. Oh, all right. There's a, there's a, there's a part of me that's tempted to reinstall it just to show you how good I am at uh, building towers. Oh, no. All right. I, I was off it for a year. I, okay. Anyways, so I wanted to, I wanted to offer another thought uh, onto this uh, this thread that we've been uh, unfolding. W- one of the issues that I had when I was uh, was younger is you know I would complain a lot about going to school. I I didn't like it very much, and my dad would say uh, similar to what you're saying here, which is you're learning how to learn. And I thought that was just my dad being dismissive, so that I could just. And so I would leave him alone. I, I I learned to do what I'm doing today, and I I did some I did a lot of uh, animation when I was a kid. And the thing that's really important uh, that I really want to add to this is that if we don't necessarily have like a support network, what you need is a way to produce results, even if they're small results, even if you just get like a you know a top five animation of the day award something to start building that foundation of if I do things my way, I can actually produce uh, results. And so that, that was something that I was really fortunate to have. Uh, there, there is a website. It's, it, it can get rather uh, violent at times, but it's called newgrounds.com. And people would just make their flash animations, upload it for free. People would vote and you'd be rewarded if, you, you know, if people liked your content and building a fan base. And a couple of the people that I connected through there are some of my friends to this day. So even just like these, these rinky-dink cartoons that look abysmal to, by any standards, even back then, it still was enough to actually start giving me something to start putting my life together. That's great. Yeah, and there's... There's where you put time and effort. If I could throw it to you in the form of a question, um, can you think back to like what were some of the earliest yields for your uh, for your independent path? I would say the earliest, earliest was when we had a garden when I was like elementary school. 
And I remember asking my mom, can we sell some tomatoes? Can we sell some cucumbers? And I put them at the end of the driveway. And I remember showing up at the end of the day and going out there to check on them and there'd be money in there, like in the little box that we put. So I was like, that's really cool. I made money. Otherwise I wouldn't have made money anywhere. Um, I didn't, you know, I was a little kid and, you know, a dollar back then was like probably 50 now I don't, <laughs> with inflation. <laughs> um, so that's my first memory of that sort of thing. And then just along the way, we created a family business that was just like our crafts and stuff. Just, I think our parents just did it for fun. Um, just to get a little extra money. Uh, we had puppies back when I was little and I saw the the rewards from that and you know the money that came in from doing that and just that kind of sale and then I continued it once I went to college with this little side business of selling clothes um honestly it was not nothing I ever thought I would go into but when I had my daughter she she was born with a disease and I kind of needed to stay home because I wanted to make sure she was taken care of right and I just kind of out of boredom and kind of out of necessity, I would go to the outlets and start, you know, buying products and selling them because it was kind of what I was used to from all these years. So that's kind of my journey. It was just like these small bits and pieces of affirmation along the way. It wasn't always affirmation. Sometimes I couldn't sell something or I didn't make money on it or every once in a while I lost, but not too often. Um, but that was the affirmation I had. So it was just, you know, when I started doing YouTube, it just seemed like I'm home and this is something cool to do. I really like the technology and I'm a teacher. So I really want to teach people something. And then I kind of put everything together and that's how I came into the home business because that's what I've done. Uh, and then I just taught people what I was doing to save money and make money online. So it's just grown into this really big um, to do, I guess, at this point. And uh, I just enjoy it. I have a lot of fun with it. Uh, teaching is my thing. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm able to break things down where people can follow along from beginner to expert. Yeah. One of the things I saw on your YouTube is um, your lessons were were numbered. So I think one thing that's helpful there is that if somebody jumps into a YouTube channel and they see a bunch of different titles and they think, oh, hang on a second, where do I start? So what are the, so that to me seems like something that's very distinctively a teacher uh, move yeah. where, okay, we have the structure. Yeah. So this is the beginning point. And then, so if you're on uh, lesson 52, maybe you want to go back for, oh, I'll, I don't know, all the way to one, if you don't mind. Yeah. A lot of times when I start my courses or I start a series or something, it's called backward building. So mm. my first question is, what do I want them to learn? And I work backwards actually. And I create the the main points and then I build down from that. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but that's how I do it. Well, I, I hear that and I thought of uh, reverse engineering, which I understand to be something that a lot of inventive people Similar. do. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I do it. Uh, out of everything that we've unfolded so far, technically you answered question three, uh, which is, you know... Um, how you got into e-commerce. We, we basically covered that one, but uh, this is always my favorite whenever we're like, you know, 25 minutes in and I haven't even gone to like a quarter through the questions. It's always my favorite. Like, I love that. And in continuing on with that, so I have this, um, I have my own view of like what I would like to see uh, happen to the school system. And you obviously having such a, um, uh, such a wealth of experience in that and your master's degree, this would be, I would love to I uh, hear your take on it. Let me let me set the stage. So my father and my mother would describe what happened when they were in school. And I think they were in portables and they were being taught by nuns and they had the nuns had sticks and there was physical abuse. Now I will say my parents turned out pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. you know that you know credit credit where it's due. My 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 parents took very good care of me and I'm and I and I wouldn't trade them for anyone else in the world. Uh, it wasn't even That's nice. not even any close calls. And then I go to uh, my 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 school experience and my big thing is that like I had so many people who didn't like me and that, and I've kept feeling like the the school would get me into even more trouble if I stood up to them. So I would just, you know, sit there and just kind of like take it and, and wait for the day to be over. And I have very, very few takeaways from elementary school in terms of like what I learned. Like I remember to sew. We, we did sewing in our class once. I'm like, oh, well, I remember how to oh, sew. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it got me thinking 
you know, over the course of my life is like, what would I want my kids to have as their school experience in the interest of making it better for them the same way my parents made it better for me? Um, and my thought is, I think the first, the biggest problem is the idea that it has to be done in a set amount of time where kids have to head into school. Now, it, it, it is important that in your formative years, you do have to take advantage of those. It's like, it's like this crunch where you have to get your, 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 your education year after year after year, no breaks. And then people are out of school and then think, well, that's it. My learning is over. Now I'm off to the workforce. And I just don't think that makes sense. Learning, as really anybody who's uh, in in your position or of all the other people that I've talked to, is a lifelong pursuit. And so what I would like to see is a school system where the grading system is still there. That all part's fine. But people just go to classes whenever they want. It's more of a voluntary thing where imagine I like, oh, you know what? I want to apply for this job, but my math is counting with my fingers. Yeah, my math is terrible. So I go take, I sign up for math classes and I'm in a math class and there's people older than me, people younger than me, immigrants, you know, people who are just like learning the, the very basics and you walk away with this experience. So you get to hear from so many other people and you connect in a different way as opposed to being stuck with the same people year after year after year is, which for me was really hard because I didn't like them. I like, I have a few good friends from there, but yeah. Um, so, so overall, the just to sum it up is, could it work a lot better if education was a lifelong pursuit and we let people more voluntarily uh, handle their education rather than the regimented system that we have now? So uh, I'll address one thing that you said that sticks out to me is that you've come away with a few friends from there. Mm -hmm. from, and I think the fallacy is that everybody has a lot of friends. And I always tell my kids and I, I tell people I know, if you come away from high school, middle school with one good friend, you're good because that one good friend will get you through a lot. And I mean, good. Um, so if you've got a few, I think that's great. Um, and I think it's not every, and I don't think if you check back, not everybody's friends with everybody. There's the very few that are. So I think they're the, they're exception for the rule and you're the norm actually. So. There's a thought for you. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate remind that. Remind me again, like, where, I guess I don't know that I totally agree with you because of all the research that I know and the psychology behind teaching and learning um, as far as being ambiguous with people showing up whenever. I can tell you from my perspective as a teacher, I would my mm -hmm. brain would want to blow up if people just came and left and didn't show up one day and came another day right? because there's no continuity uh, as a teacher. You don't know who's got what and, and who's been where, and and that's so inconsistent. And there, you're not you're not teaching um, consistency. And what you want in a person is, you know, you know, dependability. You know, if they're working somewhere, or like I depend on you to show up at the podcast at the time. And a lot, I honestly know a couple people that attended a school similar to what you just described. It did not go so well for them because they don't care, you know, they have this mentality of not really caring about going to work or moving on and learning. So they've been, it was drilled in them when they were younger that, yeah, whatever. And that's still their mentality today. And it was, um, really sad to see the potential lost. And it's just, you know, they could have done better had they had structure. And whenever you, uh, open the boundaries with kids, especially if, I know if I didn't have structure when I was little, I probably wouldn't be where I am now. Who knows what I would be doing because I'm, you know, we're innately sinful and kind of crazy <laughs> yep. when we're younger and we have to be taught. And part of education, my son keeps complaining because he's in algebra. He's like, why do I, why am I going to need trig and all this? That's the age old question, right? And maybe I'll help answer that for some people. I tell him, I said, it isn't. The fact that you're going to go to a job and you're going to sit down and write down a trig equation in your future. Okay. I get it. But what it's, what it's doing is developing your brain. It's developing your thought process. It's challenging you to think, and it's helping test your perseverance through difficult and problematic thinking. So it's really a thinking thing to me. I mean, some people are going to go into trig and that's going to be their thing. Yes. Majority of people aren't. Um, actually my major touched on <laughs> calculus and trig after I'd had asked that question in high school. <laughs> um, but 
and I didn't know it, but it, ta- it taught you to, uh, it teaches you to think and we need thinkers in this society, not robots that just go about doing everything they're told to do. And the people that learn to think you're going to be able to fix your own computer at home and not want to throw it on the floor. I mean, I still want to throw mine on the floor sometimes, yeah. but you know what I mean? You're, you're going to be able to think through those processes and hopefully what I would like to see is almost like a melding or merging of new thinking and old, or let's say new technology and old thinking. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. Because what's taught and the formal education and the information that's there is good, but we need to integrate the technology and we need to integrate all the new stuff. Like it's going light, so lightning fast. And here's the problem. Anybody that's out in the world doing what I'm doing right now isn't in a school teaching it. They're online teaching it, right? Mm Because I don't need to go get a a job and go teach it. However, (laughs) it's funny I mentioned this because my daughter is actually going into a marketing and web design class. And uh, I think it's great because they have pull out schools, I'll call them, or, you know, additional to regular education high school where I think that's where it's at anymore. Like learning web design and programming and whatever else, uh, spe- you know, specific things that are technology targeted, you know, um, like a, it's called career tech here. So like a technical school, um, that's kind of where, what we're talking about is uh, in my opinion. So that's the new morph maybe. Mm-hmm. Well, you you raised a lot of good points, and uh, and I'm and I'm glad I was able to uh, bring my idea to to someone with your uh, expertise on it because it's important to figure out what the holes are, and it turns out it's Swiss cheese, so that's all well and good. Um, one one thing I did want to clarify though, um, it's just like a micro variable is people choosing to take classes, but I I would still want there to be like a commitment level where once they sign up for it, they are going to uh, stick to it, but. Overall, what it does is by not compelling people to be uh, committed to the same way that the school system compels people now, that can uh, uh, yield uh, negative results. And you have tangible examples to point to, too, of schools that are like that. Uh, so it's left me with a lot to think about. And, and I think it's important, too, is that that structure uh, is you know, the reason why we have it is because we need it. Like you're saying, we're all nuts, especially when we're kids. And so (laughs) I I don't know, I guess for for me being such an anomaly, I think about how I've gotten to where I am. And and a lot of that had to do with the the freedom to teach myself on my own time and go online and and develop skills outside of school, skills which actually helped me survive school better. Like I I took the animation that I learned, went to school with it, and and I was able able to do uh, presentations. So I was using my skills and I was testing them in school rather than learning them in school and testing them in the in the real world. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But there, there's definitely a lot there to think about. So, yeah, I, I thank you for that one. Yeah. And, you know, part of what you're describing is college or, you know, community college, because you get to pick what courses you get to pick what you want to do. You can show up or not show up. I mean, it's you're paying for not getting educated then. But so it's college has a lot of those characteristics that you just described. You show up, you don't show up, you know, it's it's up to you, but uh, that's a lot of those characteristics. All right, Amy. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna shift gears because I definitely want to get um, your your eBay experience uh, in this episode as well. We don't talk about eBay like all that much. This is Shopify country, but whenever we have the opportunity to hear about the other avenues, I, we take it. You offer uh, that that route of dropshipping on eBay with an AMC Scout and a DSM tool. Uh, there's a few things to break down, and I know that we alluded earlier that like the situation it might be a bit on the saturated side, so we can definitely like retouch on that point. But what edge does uh, someone gain uh, going the eBay route as like maybe like their primary focus for for e-commerce and for dropshipping? Well, whenever I talk to people and they're just starting, I usually tell them to go eBay first because you get your hands in in, in the industry, you know, you get your feet wet and it's not so strict. It's not as hard to get in there and start working and make mistakes. So Amazon is like a bigger beast, a lot more strict. Mm -hmm. It's best if you have like a business name, a business number. So 
I point people and direct them towards eBay because of those reasons and kind of get some experience and then shift their, their selling experience into Amazon. And, you know, for your case, uh, Shopify, you know, those are all a little bit more heavily experienced people. It's not necessary. I mean, they could start anywhere. It's mm-hmm. just, again, goes back to that person's drive and how much they want to learn and how much they can independently do their own thing. Okay. I, I think I understand this. So if we look at um, selling on Shopify, um, now, mind you, again, being uh, being a different case, uh, being brought on to uh, Debutify, I definitely have like, you know, a, an above average amount of resources at my disposal to do it. So it was, it is easier for me than the average person to uh, hop on the Shopify and get started. Uh, so with that granted, what I'm understanding is with eBay is that the individual is just focused on selling. Whereas if I go into Shopify, I also have to really think about branding and I have to think about uh, copy and I have to use uh, develop several apps. Uh, and it, there's there's advertising involved, putting ads on the Facebook. Uh, there's remarketing, uh, affiliate marketing. There's there's a lot, and you know we've we're like oh, I think like sixty episodes in, so we've definitely uh, covered a lot of this. And whereas so with eBay, it seems to me that the starter kit is actually just like signing up for an account, picking the product, and then well, I mean at that point, how do you com- how how are people competing? Are people just like looking up the product and it just so happens they'll find yours or uh, what are people doing to actually like get themselves more exposure than the next person? So originally when I started, I would go through actual newspapers, flyers on Sunday nights, I would get the newspaper and I'd find products that were on sale for the week. I would list those products. I would drop ship them from like Kmart, Walmart, wherever. There wasn't much competition. Nobody was really doing it. I would usually, usually sell whatever I listed Today, I mean, it's it's turned into a lot of software that helps you target products that's based on metrics and uh, analytics and everything that goes on behind the scenes. They scenes they figure out exactly what's selling for how much. So you can you can do what I did still, and and put those products in and get the chance that you'll sell them with a little bit of research on what's selling on eBay. So it's gone from a shot in the dark to pinpointing things with software. My original way was a shot in the dark, just guessing. With less competition, though, today it's pinpointing products that are actually selling for this amount, and this is how much you should sell it for in order to make this profit. So is it is it doable? Absolutely. People are doing it every day. Um, I At one point, I sold between $500 and $1,000 per day. Uh, drop shipping onto eBay. So can you do it? Yes. Uh, does it take a little bit of work? Yes. But is it hard work? No. Uh, it's just a matter of learning how to do it, applying those products into your eBay store. And I mean, that's the simple answer. There are s- little steps you have to take to set your store up, but it's not hard. Not like um, Shopify where you're increasing, you know, and, but, you know, you reap what you sow. Once you have your Shopify store, then it's all your product and all your profit. You're not giving it to eBay. You're not giving it to Amazon. So that's the appeal to me with setting up my Shopify store. That's why I set one up um, because I want my own thing. I don't want to have to give a percentage to anyone else. I want to take the profits that are truly mine and keep them. Right, yeah, because eBay would get a cut of, of their sales, uh, which is how. Whereas Shopify, you you pay them to to use a service altogether, and then after that, it's uh, it's all up to you. So you you you're, now this is the first time that anyone has like mentioned that they would drop ship by way of uh, going to retail stores, like going to Walmart or Kmart. Uh, can we just like stop there for a second? Um, so somebody orders something on eBay, and then <laughs> are you driving like? I, I mean, I'm just trying to think, how are you getting the product uh, from Walmart? Or did you already buy it and then you're selling it? Let's just talk about that would be baby steps. Like that would be the original way back in 2001 right, right. when yeah. I started. I would actually have a product and then I would sell it or I would not like sell it if I knew it was there. Now, drop shipping is I would go to the website Kmart and order it and ship it, put the ship to address of the person that bought it. So that's drop shipping. Oh, yeah, so, okay. So, King right, because these guys have Walmart, their online 
certain pro- platforms as well. Yeah. And so they would do all the shipping. I just basically, I'm the order processor, if you want to call it, what, what if you want to call it that, <laughs> but they termed it a drop shipper. Mm-hmm. And so I, I'm, I'm explaining to a couple of my friends, you know, they asked me, Hey Joe, so what are you doing these days? And I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> here we go. And so one of the things that they ask is, well, hold on a second. Why don't I just go to like AliExpress and, and buy the product um, without having to buy it on, on Shopify? And I said, that's actually a very good point. Frankly, I've done that too. The, uh, for our listeners, we're, we're making our way towards video. We're not there yet, but um, I'm wearing these uh, compression gloves that help uh, reduce arthritis. Uh, you know, at least fingers crossed. And I paid like 20 bucks for them. Well, I found, I just found them on AliExpress like last week because another guest was talking about them. They were like three bucks. So I ordered, I ordered 20 bucks worth and now I'm set for like the next 10 years. So what I tell them is that the reason why you're paying me is because I'm doing the marketing. I'm almost like shopping on your behalf. I am finding what works for you. I am advertising as so that you can see it and I'm doing it at scale. So lots of people can see it at the same time. I'm doing you a favor by introducing this product to you for the first time and so it's almost like you're 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 paying you're compensating me for that now if people are intuitive enough and they go on to aliexpress and every time they see a product online well okay they're not they're not our target audience anymore or they're not the market anymore they're there are our there are listeners there are people who i'll probably be interviewing they're the people who are like more adept at it um so comparing that to ebay i i guess I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. So essentially someone just is just looking for what they're looking for on eBay because the product happens to already be a somewhat uh, known that it's on sale or if you're seeing it on your newspaper, then other people are seeing it on theirs. And so then they're, they're just ordering it from, from the, from, from you. And then you're ordering from them. Uh, I got it. Right. Did I miss any key details here? I don't think so. I, I think it goes back to brand commitment too. Like there are eBayers, people uh, that buy yeah, on yeah. eBay, and then there's people that buy on Amazon, and it's time saving, uh, it's brain uh, I, affirmation. Like I, I've done this before. I know if I do this, it's going to be okay. They started with Amazon. That's what they're used to. That's what they stick with. Same thing for eBay. Blah blah blah. Then there's the venture people. Oh, that looks neat and new. And, oh, I saw that ad and they, you know, spontaneously click and buy something they never thought they were going to buy because they saw an ad. (laughs) Um, Interestingly about AliExpress, I honestly, munch today, I sent my friend a link of a video I did on AliExpress because her daughter wanted to know where my son got his really, really expensive sneakers. And I just laughed because she asked me the other day, Oh, Mia wants those sneakers so bad, and and uh, my but I just can't pay that much. I laughed. I said, "You think I really paid what Dix is asking for them?" <laughs> and um, and she's like, "What do you mean?" So I I pointed her out to AliExpress, and I think the deal is, I know the people that are listening to this podcast are those people that we talked about that have ventured outside the box. They're the few. Like how many people think like that? How many people know about AliExpress? Probably 1% of the population, if that. I wouldn't even say it's that high, at least where I am and the people I know personally in the normal world. I would not call where we are in the normal world. Um, We venture out. We think outside the box. AliExpress is outside the box. Uh, Shopify is outside the box. Um, And it's creating your own thing. So that's why eBay works. That's why a Shopify store works because people are branded basically. And they're used to that. You see, if you see a Nike sneaker on a shelf, you go into the store, it's $150. You see that same Nike sneaker next to it looks exactly the same. Seems to be the same. You touch it, same color, same everything, but it says, Hojo sneakers next to it. They're both $150. Which one are you going to buy? They're They're branded. Yeah, they're both $150. Nike. Nike, yeah. Neither. (laughs) Neither. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, (laughs) Okay, I I, I get what you're saying. uh, Yeah, the brand is what you're buying. So, you know, creating a brand on Shopify is fantastic. Um, But that's that's the discrepancy there. Uh, how far can somebody get with a brand on eBay? Is there any room for for branding or personalization? 
Oh yeah. Um, you can make your own stores and create your own thing. Yeah. So it's, so people can come back to you and you can have like people click on your name and you, or your store name and you can go see all your products. Yeah, I was, I'll, I'm going to say this is the first time that, and, and again, I, I can't reiterate enough how like, you know, uh, distinct my own uh, pathway has been. Um, so it's very rare that I would encourage people to take after my example. But it seems to me that one of the main advantages of eBay is to build that early muscle memory for like actually learning how to like sell a product, get it to a customer and make sure that they're, they're happy. It's the, some of the, some of the earliest motions and some of the early, so for people who like never sold anything in their life, um, before they go hop on the Shopify and they have to run a whole store and they have to come up with a whole image and they also have to learn how to actually do the physical selling that, that can be a lot more and that can end up overwhelming a lot of people. So, uh, I think there's a lot of value to that. Yeah. Starting with eBay is a great place to start. Uh, I've been in Shopify, I have my own store and what I've, t what I knew from eBay is what I have and learned over the many years of doing it. I think the critical thing would be tags and SEO search engine optimization, critical in having your products be found without trying to market every single thing, which, you know, marketing is the whole other part of you know, what Shopify is about. If you're a good marketer, you're going to sell your product and you have to know your audience and you have to know, you know, who you're targeting and that sort of thing. So, you know, those points are critical, uh, getting started, but you can start. I mean, you got to start somewhere. That's when I did a webinar, uh, two weeks ago. And one of my images on my webinar on my screen on my presentation was a car and a guy in the car, a parking lot. And there was one car moving in that parking lot. Parking lot was filled with uh, cars, maybe like an airport or something. One car was moving. And that's what I was encouraging people to do. Don't only just like get the key, sit in the driver's seat and turn the engine on, like put it in gear and push the gas. Be that one car that actually starts and goes and moves and does something. So that was my encouragement. People listening to this right now, be that car that's moving in the parking lot. Like do something about why you're here. You're here because you have an interest. You want to do something different. Uh, you know where you are is like the parked car in the parking lot. It's not going anywhere. Um, get in that car and do something. Move around. Go for it. Take that step. I support that 100%. And just alluding back to the story that I told earlier when I lost my uh, my sales job and said, I'm just going to make up podcasting, is that from that day going forward, I treated it like I was a professional. Was I making money? No. Was I breaking even? No. Was I spending money to do it? <laughs> loads. Yes. So yeah, emptied my savings to, uh, to, to pursue it. At that time, at least as good as I could do, professional quality. And I think one thing that happens is this idea that becoming a professional is this impenetrable barrier or like I have to get a, a certain credentials before I can be considered a professional. And like, you know, this might end up being Swiss cheese, but I think the real, the difference between like an amateur and a professional is that you can't tell when a professional is having a panic attack. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Cause the other week I wasn't feeling too well when I did my webinar and the, and, uh, the person I was working with emailed me back and she's like, well, you were very professional because I couldn't tell you weren't feeling well. And I'm like, that's right. You know, you learn how to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm on day four of, uh, of my current panic attack. And yes, uh, so far, so good. <laughs> Looking good. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Sounding good too, right? <laughs> Thankfully, uh, I sound good. Sometimes my voice gets shot. So whenever I have like a 7 p.m. Uh, interview, I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, welcome back to Ecomonics. So uh, listeners, you can uh, point out, if you can point out which episodes I sound like that, feel free to let me know. Uh, I got I got one more eBay question, but this is I guess more out of curiosity than anything. But like having um, participated in it for the length of time that you had, did you notice any like s like major shifts in the way people perceived eBay, or if any major operational shifts, or like any major milestones for it? And just to give you a chance to like stew that, I'll I'll make a comparison to it with like Facebook, for instance. I remember once upon a time, Facebook Messenger was like kind of like emailing where we would just say, Hey man, it's, it's great to connect with you. Let's catch up sometime. Yeah. Yeah, totally. But it wasn't the idea of like actually chatting with people wasn't conveyed. Facebook has undergone some pretty significant changes, even as far as like last week. 
So structurally, it's not the same place. I'm wondering along those lines if uh, you observed anything about eBay. Oh, yeah. Um, eBay was very laissez-faire in the, in the beginning. Like almost anything goes, anybody could sell. I think they just wanted people on there. And it didn't have a great reputation. Things were cheap. You might have gotten a bad product. And it has shifted over the years to people doing what I'm doing, like drop shipping a lot of products. So you don't know where it's coming from now. It's not necessarily originally eBay was like the auction place and primarily auction. And people didn't even really know what buy it now was or Mm -hmm. reserve price and that sort of thing. Now it's like major, major drop shipping and stores. And it's turning similar to Amazon. I remember having a conversation with somebody I know saying, well, why don't you get it on eBay? And they're like, oh no, I buy on Amazon. Like, like it was like the Amazon people (laughs) and the eBay people. I was on eBay. I was on both selling, but I could see the difference in the buyers. People on Amazon would rather pay a little bit more and get their product fast and get a better product. And it could, or it could have been even the same product, but they knew the quality of the shipping and the, uh, customer service that Amazon got. eBay didn't have such a uh, reputation. Now in the last, I would say eight, eight years, eight, five to eight years, things have drastically changed in eBay. They're a little tighter. Their restrictions are more, they kick people off more often. Uh, this one time, this was about four years ago. I was, and I had been on for what would be like 15 years selling on eBay. I had this one product. I listed 50 of them by accident and I only had five. So I accidentally hit a zero, didn't realize it. And I was sitting watching a movie and I hear cha-ching, cha-ching. So that's my sound when I sell something on eBay and my notification. And it kept going cha-ching, (laughs) cha-ching. I was like, what is going? My phone is broken. What is going on? I was going to ignore it because I just wanted to watch a movie, which I don't usually. And I looked down and here I'd sold like 15 of those things that I had just listed like an hour ago. And I'm like, oh, I only have five. <laughs> so um, and I'm, this is to the point of eBay becoming more strict. They shut my account. They like reduced my account to like $500 worth of products and four products a month. And and I was like, holy smokes, your restrictions are horrible because I've been on here 15 years. I made a one typo mistake. And so yes, they've gotten tighter with who's selling because their reputation wasn't what Amazon's was. And they're trying to, I think, bring that up to similar status. In the long run, Amazon may be better off because they have that leniency of auctions and lower prices and that sort of thing. One little tidbit that I don't think people even realize about Amazon, you don't always want to buy the first product that you see Mm -hmm. because those are the higher price products and they're the ones that won the buy box, which means basically, you know, they put ads out and they're paying for it and they're usually the more expensive products. If you click down, you may find, and it, there's a tiny little bar that most people don't know to click on. You're going to find a list of maybe 10 other sellers on there that might have it for cheaper. So that's a little purchasing uh, tidbit and, and advice. But, you know, there's a lot of leniency in eBay. eBay's restrictions have come up. So their product sales and stuff have kind of gotten better like quality. Um, so they're trying to compete. Obviously, you got to do something to everybody's trying to do something Mm -hmm. to compete with Amazon at this point. And I wouldn't say like to a point we were talking about earlier, selling on Amazon and eBay, it's not saturated. It's just more so than it was in the past. The room for growth is in the billions of dollars. It's predicted that that the sales are going to go up like three more billion dollars in the next year, year and a half online sales. So is it like saturated and you can't sell anything? No, no way. You know, so that's why making a Shopify store, doing eBay, doing Amazon, doing anything online selling is going to be great because us, the 1% or less that are outside the box are the ones making and making those sales in the millions and billions. It is in the billions of dollars of sales online. You know, whenever I, 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 I we hear the word saturated, there's always like a, a counter a way to that, which is, well, even products that are like are, are considered highly saturated. Usually what happens is you give it like six months and then, you know, 
people have kind of like moved on and then you can just reintroduce it. So uh, it, that, that I think that particular term is way more prohibitive than, um, than it actually is. So it's just something to keep in mind as well. Um, so Amy, we're, uh, we're, we're pretty low on time because I know I don't have you forever. I, th this one was like one thing I wanted to just kind of like make sure I, I understood it correctly and everything, uh, it's, it's a slight gear shift. So in your description, you talk about not just how to make money, but also to save money online. And I just want to like, is saving money in relation to e-commerce or how people can like spend their money online more effectively? Or is it just like getting into Roth IRAs? Because we've had a couple of people talk about Roth IRAs already. Well, yes and yes to the first two. Okay. Uh, save money as you are doing your e-commerce and uh, purchasing. Like for instance, when I was on Facebook, I saw an ad for these snowshoes. They were like uh, snow ski shoes. Like you could ski down the mountain. They were only like a foot and a half long. The Facebook ad was, the product was $150 on sale for $125. And I was like, oh, I know where I can look for that one. <laughs> right there, that's the save money. You don't want to go buy that stuff. I went on AliExpress and I actually bought them for $27. I mean, so I teach you that kind of stuff on my channel. The other part is like what I mentioned earlier. Like if you're a drop shipper and you're drop shipping, then you should get on a cashback website, order your drop shipping stuff. So for instance, if you sell something on Home Depot, you've listed an item, let's just say it's a generator. You put it on eBay, you sold it. You don't just go back to Home Depot and order that product. You go into Be Frugal, Rakuten, uh, honey, those are the websites I teach you how to uh, make better use of your money by getting cash back. And then you add a credit card that gives you points. Like at the end of the year, like November, December, I cash in on my points on my credit cards that I've spent on drop shipping and, and doing products that I sell, resell and stuff. And that's where I get gift cards to buy Christmas presents. Like, so Christmas presents are free. The Bose headsets canceling, uh, noise canceling headset. I think I paid $40 for them mm -hmm. after I cashed out on some of my gift cards. Like it's just using your money smarter, really. Um, so those types of things I teach on my channel. That's, uh, th that's insightful for sure. I, I mean, I've got honey so far, but, uh, beef rugo and ragcutin news to me. So I'll, I'll say that. And yeah, it's just, it, you know, it's, it's going to help people with their bottom line. So they don't feel the sting as much whenever they look and they see that their Shopify bill has is, is just come in and uh, they haven't done anything. Not, not, not uh, pointing fingers or anything. Uh, just, just some, yeah. All right, Amy. So uh, before I, I, I let you go, I have, uh, this is a very woo woo question for anybody who's like, all right, that's enough. I'm out of here. You know, this is actually, you know, uh, thanks for joining us. Take it, take care. Um, but me, I'm like a, one of my favorite uh, parts of the human experience is having dreams because I always feel like dreams are a way to um, communicate with uh, with a higher cause. And I had this one dream where I, I thought I was meeting with God. Like I was in his office and he was on the opposite side and he was just like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, I'm good. He's like, do you want to keep going? And then behind him is this open door and beyond the door was blackness. So I took it as like a metaphor for death. Um, and I said, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And he says, okay. And and that was it. Because presumably he's uh, quite busy. And right. <laughs> it happened about six years ago. And, and I still uh, think about it to this day. And it's like, the, it's the most like, uh, um, spiritual experience that I've had in my life. And I choose the dream path because it's, to me, it seems like a very tangible way to actually like, have these uh, experiences. Uh, I, I, I don't have an ayahuasca dealer uh, and I'm probably not going to get one, at least uh, not, not for a good long while. Yeah, I'm just gonna, I just I say that right now. I'm probably not going to take it. Uh, I was just wondering if you've had any uh, ex uh, spiritual experiences or if you've experienced any closeness and if it's had any, um, any impact on your, on your life at that point going forward. Oh, wow. It's not where I thought you were going to go with. Uh, but I'll, I'll, well, you, you can tell me I'll where get, you thought because uh, I'm curious about that too. <laughs> I'll get into that answer. Um, but I, as far as the dreams, I thought you're going to say, you know, what is your dream? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. General? As I'm asking that, I'm like, she probably thinks that's what's <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I, and I tell people you got to dream a dream to make a dream come true. Or that's my, my, I don't know if I made that up or not. Um, so think about that. You got to dream a dream to make a dream come true. So you can't say, Oh, that's my dream. And it happens like, well, you had to dream it ahead of time. So to make it come to fruition, 
So don't be afraid to be a dreamer. I'm a dreamer. I, I have so many things I want to do. I have my store, Top Shopia. I want to create my drawings, put them onto products, um, put them into different stores and and drop ship wholesale and you know do all those. Those are my in life, real life dreams. Have I had a spiritual experience? You'd have to do an entire other podcast with me for me to hit those. So the answer is yes. Uh, thus, the reason I went to Messiah College, a Christian college, uh, high school is when I basically committed myself to Christ uh, based on the spiritual experience that I had in high school. Um, so it is real, the spiritual world, totally real. Um, I have, have firsthand experience, and that is why I call myself Christian, because I am a Christ follower. So that is my experience. And yes, um, I could talk another hour about those. So that is the reason why I um, created a channel or, an, or a channel that I haven't released yet for YouTube. I draw my pastor's sermons and that's something else that I'm going to get into and market and just, that'll be a fun thing for me. That's my dream. That's wonderful. I, I, I appreciate that. And let, you know, it being the, the end of the, uh, the episode of an e-commerce podcast, that's as far as we'll, uh, uh, we'll go with it today, but, um, well, we'll, we'll see where we go from here. I, I, I do want to hear it, but I know you gotta, you gotta go. So, uh, we're going to get you on Addy. Uh, the last question I got to wrap this one up is for people who want to see more of your content or get in contact with you and just let them know what to do. And then if you have any final words of wisdom, maybe an answer to a question I didn't ask. Uh, not that you haven't given us plenty already, but just in case you want to share a little bit more, feel free. So the floor is yours once more. Okay. So my basic form of communication is through my YouTube channel called Home Business Expert. And my website is called amyhunt.com or amyhunt.biz. I'm sorry, amyhunt.biz. And I have also a blog on there as well that you can get connected to my email. I do one-on-one sessions. Uh, I'll often get in contact with different softwares and get my viewers discounts. So if you're thinking about getting a software, come to my channel because I might have a discount for it and a link to get you to it. So that's pretty much all I have. All right. Terrific. Uh, well, everybody, uh, Unless this is your first time uh, listening to this, you probably know the drill by now. And if you don't, uh, check out Amy's content. Check out all of our previous episodes as well. Uh, there was a lot of people to to learn from, and we're just happy to be able to share this kind of value with you. I certainly am happy to be the recipient of so much of it. So thanks to all of you for your participation. Amy, thanks again for your time, and we will check in soon. Take care. Thanks for listening. You might have found this show on many number of platforms. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or right here on Debutify. Whatever the case, if you enjoy this content and want to help us thrive, please take a few moments to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you think is best. We also want to hear from you, so whether you think you'd be a good guest or want to weigh in on anything related to our show, you can email podcast at Debutify.com or connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Finally, this podcast is created by the passionate team at Debutify. If you're ready to take the plunge into e-commerce or are looking to up your game, head over to Debutify.com and see how it can change your life and the lives of many through what you do next.